Palestinians are holding a state funeral in Ramallah for the Palestinian-American Al Jazeera reporter Shireen Abu Akla, a day after she was fatally shot in the head while covering an Israeli military raid on a Janine refugee camp in the occupied West Bank. Witnesses, including other journalists at Al Jazeera, said she was shot dead by Israeli forces. At the time of her death, she was wearing a helmet and a vest marked press. Ali Al-Samoudi, a Palestinian journalist, was wounded alongside Abu Akla. The occupation is murderous and criminal. They shot us for no reason. We, a group of journalists, were there wearing our full press uniforms, in addition to the helmets with the word press written on them in large letters, as big as the whole world. We were obvious. Shireen Abu Akla was a U.S. citizen. She worked at Al Jazeera for a quarter of a century. She was one of the best-known television journalists in Palestine and the Arab world. Israel initially claimed she may have been shot by a Palestinian gunman, but later said it was unclear who shot her. Palestinian authorities accused Israel of committing the, quote, crime of execution, and rejected an offer from Israel to carry out a joint probe into her death. On Wednesday, al Salame, the head of the Palestinian Media Association, spoke out against the killing of Shireen Abu Akla and other Palestinian journalists. Our protest today confirms that the occupation must be pursued. Pursue the Israeli leaders and war criminals who were involved in these crimes, the crimes which led to the death of those journalists, and their last was the journalist Shireen Abu Akleh. For more, we're joined by the acclaimed Palestinian-American Middle East historian Rashid Khalidi, the Edward Said Professor of Modern Arab Studies at Columbia University, the author of a number of books, including The Hundred Years' War on Palestine. Professor Khalidi, welcome back to Democracy Now! If you can talk about what happened to Shireen, the significance of um, what has taken place, the latest we know about her death, and even where she was covering an Israeli raid and a Janine refugee camp. Right. Um, well, the, the, this is this is a terrible shock to people all over the Arab world uh, and to anybody who has followed events in Palestine, because she was probably the most prominent reporter covering uh, what is happening there for the last, as you said, quarter of a century. Um, what she was covering was yet another raid on the Janine refugee camp. Uh, Janine is the site among many other things, of um, a very serious battle that took place during the Second Intifada in 2002, um, when a large number of Israeli soldiers, perhaps as many as 24, were killed and 50 Palestinians were killed, including both resistance fighters and uh, civilians in the camp. And ever since then, uh, Israel has basically uh, imposed collective punishment on the refugee camp and the region. Um, uh, all of this takes place against a background of increasing anger and frustration all across the occupied territories at the unending nature of the occupation, at the fact that there is no political horizon whatsoever. Israel refuses to change an occupation that has been in place for 55 years and, in fact, is tightening it in many respects. And so there have been attacks on Israelis. There have been all kinds of outbreaks of violence. And the Israeli response has been the response of every colonial army, which is collective punishment um, and vengeance. Uh, what has been happening all over the occupied territories in response to horrific attacks on Israeli civilians inside Israel is essentially sanctioned, state-sanctioned murder, um, in many cases of unarmed civilians. And uh, yesterday, uh, of uh, an unarmed journalist who was clearly marked uh, as a journalist wearing a protective vest with press across the front and a helmet with press uh, on her head. Um, this, is, uh, this is what colonial armies do. Uh, they, they, they believe that only force uh, and, and nothing but force uh, is understood by the lesser peoples whom they rule. And that's, that's the kind of attitude that the Israeli military has. Um, their, lying, their systematic lying and cover-ups, in this case, fell apart uh, when the Israeli um, human rights organization B'Tselem showed that Israeli claims that there was gunfire from Palestinians, in fact, related to some place that was hundreds of meters away and that, that uh, where uh, Shireen and her colleagues were targeted uh, was an area where there was no there was no shooting going on except by Israeli snipers who killed her wounded one of her colleagues.
Professor Khalidi, could you also speak about the significance of the fact that uh, she was Palestinian American? Right. Well, I, I have a sense that if a Palestinian, that if an, if an American journalist were killed by the Russians in Ukraine, we would be hearing even more about it. Um, I, I'm, I, I have to say that this is a person who is widely known throughout the Arab world. Um, but the fact that this is the second American killed by Israelis uh, in the space of a couple of months, I think three months, um, has not gotten the kind of outrage that it would have gotten in another situation. Um, she, however, it, it has to be said, the fact that she is an American citizen, the fact that she is well known to her colleagues of the press. I think has affected the coverage in a positive way. Nevertheless, the systematic lying and cover-ups that the Israeli government is so adept at doing uh, were wheeled out almost immediately. Uh, uh, claims that they've in fact had been forced to back down from. Um, but perhaps the fact that Shireen was an American uh, will lead to a little more concern about the systematic uh, uh, brutality that the occupation is wielding all over the occupied territories. Um, this case is egregious, but young men are being shot down almost every day, unarmed young men, demonstrators, whatever. In some cases, yes, there's, there's, there, there are clashes, but in many cases, what is happening is that people who are either totally innocent or are involved in demonstrations are being murdered uh, by Israeli uh, snipers. And this is what seems to have happened in this case. Professor Khalidi, who's the first American? You said she was the second American to be killed uh, in, in recent months. Uh, who was the uh, first? There was an elderly Palestinian American who was stopped at an Israeli checkpoint and then put face down on the ground in the middle of the night, and he died, uh, presumably of a heart attack because of maltreatment by the Israeli forces. I, I don't recall his name. I think uh, it, was it was Omar a, Abdel um, uh, Majid Assad. Exactly. Uh, I, I believe that was about three months ago. Uh, I mean, it might have been February uh, that he was arrested, uh, detained, uh, taken to an empty building in the middle of the night. It was a very cold night. Uh, he was on his way home after a uh, family visit uh, and uh, with other detainees put face down in the dirt uh, and then was found lifeless uh, very soon thereafter. He was, an older, he was an elderly man with a heart condition. Rashid Khalidi, your family uh, is there. Um, you're a well-known family in the West Bank. Um, if you could talk about the effect this has had, I understand at the funeral today they're projecting Shireen's image across Ramallah, where a state funeral is being held for her, and again to talk specifically about the Jenin refugee camp and the Israeli raid, one of a number of raids that are taking place. They call it right. a counterterrorism raid. Right. Well, people are shocked uh, all over Palestine, all over the Arab world, actually. Shani um, was a was a household name. I mean, we, her her face was 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 uh, familiar to everybody in the Arab world who follows news from Palestine on on Al Jazeera, which is the the, the preeminent uh, channel, uh, uh, Arab satellite channel, covering Palestine in particular. Um, so the the shock yesterday was universal. Um, people woke up to the news in the United States. They'd heard it uh, much earlier in Palestine and the Arab world. Um, and so there have been actually ceremonies and memorials for her all over the occupied territories, all over Palestine. Um, uh, Jenin has become a symbol uh, of resistance. Uh, and I, I want to say something here, which is that we are now praising and lauding uh, Ukrainians who resist Russian occupation. Palestinians who resist Israeli occupation, which has been going on for 80-something days, for 55 years, since June 1967 in the occupied territories, um, are branded as terrorists by the Israelis and by media that just repeats parrots, that sort of thing. They would never describe uh, Ukrainians fighting Russian occupation as terrorists. Um, so Janine is a symbol of, of resistance because, as I mentioned, of a battle that took place um, in uh, 2002, during during the second intifada, when the Israelis moved into the camp and they were they were confronted uh, by Palestinian militants who fought them uh, over several days, and uh, as I've said, about 50 Palestinians were killed, m many of them many of them militants, many of them civilians, and about 20 24 Israeli soldiers were killed. Ever since then, 
uh, Israel has adopted a policy, as it does everywhere always, of collective punishment, uh, of punishing a region, of punishing a district, of punishing, in this case, a refugee camp, perpetually putting uh, 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 checkpoints close around the camp, entering in the middle of the night, uh, destroying property, uh, beating people up, uh, arresting people, uh, and so forth. Um, and because several of the people whom the Israelis uh, claim or believe perpetrated attacks inside Israel, in which a num many Israelis, I think as many as 19 Israelis, have been killed over the past uh, many weeks, um, because several of the of the supposed perpetrators or the alleged perpetrators came from Jenin or the Jenin area, um, this collective punishment and this bloody vengeance, where people are being shot down, um, sometimes in clashes, but quite frequently simply in demonstrations, or quite frequently because the Israelis are just shooting, uh, as they often do, um, is being carried out particularly systematically. Um, in, in the Jenin area and in the Jenin refugee camp. So the, 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 the incident that uh, Shanin Abarakti and her colleagues were covering yesterday was yet another Israeli uh, uh, raid uh, on this camp, uh, part of uh, what, have, what has been a, 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 rep, a repeated series uh, of raids. And these are not, you know, Israeli soldiers just going after militants. These are Israeli soldiers sacking people's homes, destroying their property, throwing things in the street, beating people up, arresting people. Uh, and uh, w whether they're innocent or whether they're involved in militant activity. Uh, Professor Khalidi, what kind of a hope do you have for uh, some kind of accountability, a further investigation and accountability for her murder? Well, the Palestinian uh, uh, Journalist Syndicate, uh, together with uh, uh, the, the International Federation of Journalists, are bringing a case uh, of, about the murder of a number of Palestinian journalists. There have been uh, something like 46 Palestinian journalists have been killed by Israeli forces since the year 2000, many of them during the Second Intifada, and several of them just this past year, in fact. Uh, Palestinian journalists have been systematically targeted. It's really important to Israel that nobody see what's going on in the occupied territories. If people knew the day-to-day -day reality, which you can only find out through the work of j brave journalists like Shireen, who gave her life to cover this story, uh, nobody would know. Um, the Israelis are very good at bullying the media and trying to prevent the story from getting out. But at, at the base, uh, where the, the rubber hits the road, where the journalists are on the ground, they shoot Palestinian journalists all the time. As I've said, 46 have been killed since 2000, according to the Palestinian Journalist Syndicate. So the Palestinian Journalist Syndicate uh, and the International Center for Justice for Palestinians and the, the uh, International Federation of Journalists are, are bringing a case before the International Court of Justice uh, about several of these murders. Uh, Israel has started media offices repeatedly. They bombed uh, uh, several media uh, offices last May in Gaza, um, destroying entirely several bureaus. Um, and they've done this repeatedly in Ramallah and in other places. So attacks on journalists in order to squelch the story at the root are a part of the colonial uh, information control. Um, the British Empire did this everywhere, in Ireland, in India, in Egypt, in Palestine. Uh, and the Israelis have been doing it systematically and very effectively, uh, shooting at journalists, intimidating journalists uh, on the ground in Palestine, and then bullying uh, uh, editors and producers uh, here in New York and in the United States and around the world to uh, I impose their line, which is generally mendacious. They make stuff up. Um, uh, and also to prevent the truth, which is that this is a brutal occupation that's only sustained by brute force against the will of an entire people. Um, that fact and the fact that it's supported by us, the United States, these are American weapons being used, this is American money that's supporting this, uh, is something that it's essential for the Israelis to blur, to occlude, to hide. Finally, um, the Israeli Prime Minister, Naftali Bennett, went to meet with Putin. There was some talk of either, um, <clears throat> you know, Turkey's leader um, or Bennett negotiating between Russia and Ukraine. At the same time, wasn't Naftali Bennett almost toppled uh, recently as prime minister? Yes, um, he lost one member of his coalition uh, who left um, for reasons having to do um, with Passover, violations of Passover rules. Um, and then um, there was a threat by other uh, members of his coalition to leave, which I understand just today, uh, 
has been withdrawn. So his, his coalition is in very shaky shape. Um, I think they've lost their majority. They hold on with barely half the Knesset seats right now. So does that have any effect on the possibility of any kind of solution between Israel and Palestine? Well, Bennett is a settler himself. He lives in a settlement. He's, he's a committed supporter of the eternal, permanent uh, occupation of all of what's left of Palestine. Uh, he is unwilling under any circumstances to negotiate with the Palestinians. He's made that very, very clear. So he heads a coalition which includes some parties uh, that are interested in a, in a, in a negotiated settlement. But um, his party and several of the other parties in the coalition are as committed to continuing the permanent occupation of Palestine and the colonization of what's left of it the continued establishment of, of, of Israeli settlements, the continued expropriation of Palestinian land. Uh, Bennett, whatever the nature of his coalition, is not going to lead a movement towards uh, any kind of resolution uh, under any circumstances. Uh, in that respect, he differs in no, in no wise from, from uh, uh, Netanyahu and the opposition.